Hey, hi folks. My name is Ron Strand and welcome to Backstage at the Upper Room. Tonight we've got a great show planned for you and we're going to get to that in just a minute. But if you're watching tonight from you're not familiar who uh, the Upper Room is or who I am, the Upper Room is a uh, is a Christian coffee, well I'm not going to say coffee house, it's a Christian ministry uh, event driven. We, we do music, we do com uh, comedy, and we do this once a month in Orange County, California. Look us up at theupperroompresents.com, theupperroompresents.com, and you'll find out all about what we're doing. Obviously, right now with the COVID thing, uh, all of our, our uh, events are, are on hold, but we hope to get back to that very soon, and hope you guys are, are all staying healthy out there. But if you're watching from uh, uh, Chuck Girard's page or the Love Song page or Tommy Coombs page, Welcome tonight, and uh, we've got a very special, special time. If you uh, want to bring some friends into tonight, just go ahead and tag them, and uh, like us on the UpperRoomPresents.com if you're watching from one of those others, and you'll be notified for all of our upcoming uh, events and all of our upcoming live streams. We're doing this once a week, uh, and also if you these uh, broadcasts will be available the following day, which will be tomorrow on YouTube, and that's also at The Upper Room Presents, and uh, you could subscribe to us there. But like us on Facebook and subscribe to us on YouTube. So what are we doing tonight? We've got a very special program to, for you tonight. Um, I want to introduce to you uh, some very special friends and uh, some very special guys. To my immediate right is Tommy Coombs, and right next to him is Jay Truax, and then right over there next to Jay is Chuck Gerard. These guys are the originally founding members of Love Song. And we're going to go into that if you don't know who Love Song is. They are the first Christian rock band that came out in 1970. 70, 70. February of 70. And uh, we are going to be talking tonight about the documentary that we are uh, producing. Uh, the Upper Room is producing with, along with Love Song. And we're going to get into that and how this thing is all evolved and uh, some exciting things about this. We're also going to be looking to help fund this project. And if don't tune out right now if, we, if I say this is a fundraiser because if you can't give, that's okay. We really are good with that. But we're looking for some people that might get behind this. And we're, we're going to get into the details of that. But if you're, if you're not in that place, just enjoy and watch. And we, we're really excited when this thing comes out for you to see it. So we're going to just launch into this. So, guys, welcome. Thanks. Good to be here. Yeah. Good to, good to finally be doing this. It's good to finally be doing this. And we threw this thing together very quickly. And uh, so uh, we're going we're gonna to just kind of bop around tonight. We're going to show some clips uh, from the video. And so, Tommy, let's talk about where we are on this thing and before I kind of talk about it all. Well, it seems like... Well, we've been working on it for three years, for starters. Uh, it started out as a live concert, just doing a DVD. And then a whole lot of people like Michael W. Smith and others started telling us stories about how the band impacted them. And part of the reason, or maybe even the biggest reason they're doing what they're doing now is they heard the band. And actually the album that Michael W. Smith will talk about later, this was the very first album that ever came out on Maranatha Music. And Michael found this when he was 14, I'll let him tell the story. But we have two songs on here. In fact, Chuck Gerard produced it. Uh, all these four bands. Four track. Four track, that's right. About four Back grand, too. Four thousand. Four thousand. Yeah. Four so thousand So this is 19... We had a ping pong. 1976. <laughs> the Beatles album was four track, yeah. uh, Sgt. Yeah. Pepper. Right. So. So we, we started down this road of, you know, we, we shot the video and uh, we made a few mistakes there and we were missing a lot of shots. And we got kind of frustrated and then people started telling us stories. We said, well, let's interview these people. And we captured some amazing content, but we, we've actually mixed all the music, 17 songs. Yep. Sounds like a million bucks. We had a very top Grammy engineer do it all. But then we showed it to some people and they went, Oh, we want to see more of the stories, more of the interviews, and less of the modern concert. So we had a pause, and we went, okay, let's tear this thing apart and really make a true documentary <coughs> about the history of the band, which includes the Jesus movement. And we have well, more than 30 guests. But I think we're probably about 40 to 50% done. 
Yeah. And we, you know, the editing takes a long time. We're here this week filming some more. And we're good. Yes, we're going to be doing that Thursday and Friday. I'm going to give you a little bit of uh, example of some of the people that are in this. I'm going to read some of the names that you'll know. But uh, Bob Bennett, uh, recording artist. Cheryl Broderson, who is Chuck Smith's daughter. Uh, Chad Butler from Switchfoot. Chuck Butler, his father, who is uh, one of the original uh, Maranatha guys from the group Parable and, and has co-wrote uh, with uh, Love Song. Uh, ben Calhoun from Citizens Way. Some of you younger people might know those. Jeremy Camp. Uh, Paul Clark, recording artist. Uh, let's see who else we have here. Michael W. Smith. Michael W. Smith, of course. Hadley Hawkins Smith. Uh, Phil Keggy. Greg Laurie. Mike Mac. Did I say Mac McIntosh? Am I repeating nope, myself? No. Nope. Don Moen. Michelle Pilar. Uh, Kathy. Debbie Laurie. Returno. Who did I say? Uh, Chuck Smith, of course. We've got some great clips of there. Uh, Tommy Walker and. Uh, Victoria Jackson has got a little cameo <laughs> yeah. from Saturday Night Live, oh who's a gosh, friend of us here, a friend of ours him. here. So we've got some great things, and that's just a partial list of some of the people. But should we, uh, oh, let me get another little piece of housekeeping out of the way. Start typing in some questions, because we're going to be on for 90 minutes tonight talking about this, and we want to take some of your questions. So start typing questions, and my assistant, uh, Marisa, is going to help us kind of put those up on the screen, and we'll get to as many as we can, and we want to try to go to those as early as we can tonight. So you guys have some questions. Uh, type them in. Can we talk about why are we doing this? Why what is the this? central purpose of why we're doing this? Why do we think it's important? Okay, let's talk about that. Do you want to talk? Do you want to take that? Or uh, you... I'll take it for now. So we're kind of. I'm I'm the moderator here, but I'm also the producer on this uh, on this project. So um, we're all kind of involved. So we're going to kind of round table. Here's a nutshell. For, I think us as we thought about this God did something historic yep. in the Jesus movement and with this band it really wasn't about us we were just riding this wave of you know a culture being disillusioned kids looking for something better people experimenting trying to find spiritual answers and the last place we thought we'd find that was in the church yep. they just yep. you know we weren't church guys but God saved hundreds of thousands, if not millions of young people and their families. And it was a move of the Holy Spirit. And we think what's going on today yeah. in the world is even more complicated than it was then. Yes. It's certainly, I mean, with riots in the streets and pandemics and just a lot of things failing on us. You know, there's a spiritual hunger that can only be satisfied by God, God himself. And so the personal relationship, the personal visitation of the Holy Spirit, your life being, our lives were so radically changed, we just knew we wanted to tell our generation. Yeah. And so we're capturing these stories now, and you know, this is 50 years since this happened. So I, I think of us as being living, living witnesses. We were there, we saw this, yeah. and was, we're trying to document this and preserve mm -hmm. it so that several generations from now can still go like, we heard about there's this revival in the 70s. How come that's not happening now? I mean, it's a question a lot of people are asking. Well, and it's something that uh, in, in Greg Laurie's contribution to this, uh, to this uh, project said that the Jesus movement was the last great revival of our time, and that's really true. Yeah. And uh, we are, we are and, and it's fortuitous, really, uh, and not maybe fortuitous, but by the spirit, if I'm over-spiritualizing this, but we, we have, as Tommy said, we started this project three years ago with a live concert at the Upper Room. And here we are still working on this because of all the changes. But we've also seen the, uh, the hand of God in this in terms of the timing right now, right. because this is an important historic piece and a, a, a historic band that God used in a mighty way, which you're going to see in the, in the uh, documentary because we've got some wonderful, wonderful stories and background stories. Mm -hmm. But let's bring some of the other guys in here tonight. Yeah. Chuck, uh, you have, uh, you have uh, been a, uh, a musician and a songwriter and a recording artist going way, way back. And uh, talk a little bit about Love Song and what, uh, what, the, what the band meant to you in terms of your early faith. Well, uh, kind of adding to the preceding subject matter here, the, as far as like the purpose of the DVD, a lot of it, what I see is that, uh, first of all, there's been no actual history of, our band was really not on the scene for very long. We right. made two albums and we were only around for three years. Yeah. So some of the artists that went on and had longer 
ministries uh, people are more familiar with. You ask a lot of the younger people today, they know who Love Song is, they don't. So there's really been no definitive history of probably one of the most interesting stories of all the bands is ours, you know, and it's never really been told. So this is our opportunity to tell it firsthand. The other part of it is that when it is told at all, it's just an inclusion in the overall history of the Jesus Movement quote. So I think it's really going to be interesting for people and very, very strong ministry for folks to really go back and see from our eyes how it all happened for us you know, kind of step by step, yep. and um, it was for, for us. It was a um, a work of God. We there was yeah. no there was no maneuvering. You see, you have to realize the rules weren't written yet. There was no. There, it right. was called Jesus music when we first started right. because they didn't have another name for it. They didn't call it contemporary Christian. They music did not yet. till much later. That's right. It became Jesus rock, Christian rock, and all these different. As as it began to morph a little bit, you know they figured out different ways to name it but uh, so we were kind of learning as we went along you know we, there was no we, we're you know I it's kind of cliche but we were kind of building the path yeah. that others could walk through more comfortably so we you know we, we faced the things like going into schools and a bunch of hippies with long hair in a public school and you can't really talk about Jesus, but you can sing about Jesus. The yeah. problem was we would talk about Jesus, too, because our attitude was we may only have one shot with these people. So let's just preach the gospel and get out of here and maybe we'll never get to come back. But maybe some kids will get that seed planted in them. And from my own perspective, after a while, uh, I began to see that that wasn't the wisest thing we could do. Right. And we realized, began to realize, the power, you know, you don't realize the power of your own music. And when I say that, I'm not saying that we're such great writers. You know, we really believe that the Holy Spirit birthed everything. All the songs were birthed of the Holy Spirit. They, they're empowered by the Holy Spirit. And when, when you're the vehicle that receives those songs or getting the, you know, doing the songwriting, I personally don't think, well, I wrote this powerful song, yeah. you know. So it takes a while to see, you know, this music speaks. We don't have to do that much talking. Right. And yeah. so when we started to dial it back a little bit, we had more effective ministry and we, we let the music do the talking. And I think that was really important. I want to add one thing here for just clarity's sake. It says back here, the story of the first Christian rock band. And I want to say, I always tell people when I describe you know, because I just, the guy in the airport the other day when I was flying out, he asked, he saw my, he was looking at my CDs that I brought. He says, is that you? And I said, yeah. He says, uh, and so he was asking me what I, what I did and what my music was. And I said, well, I will say I was in the first Christian rock band in the United States to become famous. Because yeah. that's really true. There were a couple, when we came to Calvary, there was the Joy Band. I wouldn't necessarily call Children of the Day rock, but they were doing more contemporary type music. Yeah. And there were a lot of bands that were starting to play rock music before we got on the scene. Larry Norman had his album out when I became a Christian. So I think the proper definition is that we, you know, we're the first Christian rock band, Larry being the first one to actually do a Christian rock album, but he wasn't a band. That's right. So that's how I make the distinctive, to become well, famous in the yeah, United but States. I think Jake can speak let, let me, let yeah, me say this. The, the way Chuck and I met was we met at a nightclub. And... Um, my band was taking the place of a band that went to Vegas for a couple of weeks. That they met a band in Vegas that was Chuck was in, and invited them to come and sit in. And it was in a club in Garden Grove, Harvey's Gold Street. And so, Denny Carell was in the band, and Denny came back from Vegas and grabbed me one night and just said, "You know, do you know Jesus and all that?" I mean, it was Denny was just totally into the Bible and all this, and so. When Chuck came back, we, that's kind of how we met, and we were actually doing Bible studies at this nightclub. That was, that was 1967. Exactly. Yeah, it's not yeah. 1970. It's 1967. And, and at that point in time, Denny Carell wrote a song called Changes, and it's keeping close to Jesus, you know what I mean? And we would sing that in, uh, in nightclubs. Yeah. Yeah. And so we were, we were reading the Bible. We didn't, we didn't have any real substance like we finally got when we went to Calvary. In fact, I said I tell the story that you know God really couldn't bless. I mean, you could you could share your testimony with people, and and I think Mailer got Mailer became a Christian, and I mean maybe our a, yeah, a drummer, maybe a couple other people, but God never really blessed our you know our our testimonies per se until we actually got to to Calvary. 
but um, we were doing a Christian and a God band thing for a long time before we ever came to Calvary. And we were vegetarians. We were into that whole, the whole hippie uh, organic foods and blah, blah, blah. But I think the important thing, though, when we reminisce about the story is that we were all really trying to find who God yeah, was, exactly. right? We were seeking, all seeking we, God, yeah. You know, I, I, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't know any Bible Me stories, either. nothing, Me right? Either. So we weren't church people, so we were trying everything. But the thing that helped bind us together is we all were looking for community. We were looking for answers. We were looking for God, and we were searching yeah. everywhere. And I, that was one of the things that drew us all together, besides the respect for each other's musicality. Mm -hmm. You know, Jay's a great bass player. Chuck is a phenomenal writer and singer. And yeah, I met, I met Tommy. We were, uh, I met his buddy Fred and uh, Chuck Butler at a club that Chuck was playing out in Orange County. We all drove down from Utah. It's, it's a long story, but we were living, we became the town band in Utah for a couple of years and opened for the Grateful Dead and Credence and yeah. Steppenwolf and, you know, hung out with Jenna. I what mean, were everybody. You called, Jay? Spirit of Creation. <laughs> and Great the reason that the name of it is exactly how I was. I, when I came back from Hawaii, I went to Hawaii, lived on the North Shore and uh, I, with my Bible and five bucks and one way ticket. <laughs> A lot, that's a whole other story. And I was going to go live in a, on the island of Niihau. I wanted to go to the, this all Hawaiian island and just basically just check out. And uh, I wrote the Robinsons a letter every every week, you know, and uh, never got an answer. But uh, but we eventually hit disillusionment and things like that. Yeah. Well, I came back. We got yeah. a, I got into a band, did all the Utah thing, came back, and uh, we uh, we all ended up at Calvary, and. Uh, in, in 70. That's right. when, when Thank, after all, mm -hmm. thing kind of like went to the, you know, we met these Christian people at uh, uh, a halfway house, kind of a hippie halfway house that Calvary had put together called the Blue Top. And yeah. uh, they, yeah. we went in and tried to solve an argument and uh, <laughs> they invited us to go to church. And so I remember Chuck wouldn't come in for a couple weeks maybe uh, he sat out in the parking lot every like I said we just didn't think uh, church was uh, was the deal so um, well and I, I think we're heading towards playing a, a video in a little bit unless Ron's got something else but so many things happened so quickly to us that we didn't understand church culture and uh, we wound up in Northern California at a very formal convention <laughs> we went from Calvary Chapel and Costa Mesa, all lovey-dovey. They, they, they were prepared to receive all these hippies in. And we go to uh, a big formal conference in Northern California. They treat us as cold as ice. And, they, and it was like we walked in the building. It was like the Red Sea part of people just went someplace <laughs> yeah. else. Yeah. And we, we didn't realize we scared people. Yeah. 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 Well, it was a whole new thing, it, 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 and particularly with that generation. But t Tommy said earlier, God gave us this music, and it had power. Yeah. It had, I mean, yeah. once again, we didn't purpose to be anything. We weren't trying to be ministers or anything. We didn't want to be the anything. We just were who we were, and we did what we did, and we, you know, and it, whatever happened was what happened. And it just happened in a, in a strange set of ways, kind of, and are unique, you know. Right. And uh, when we finally got to, you can tell the story, when we got to play at that oh, deal, which yeah. was the last day. We were really... Because we were invited by one of the head people at the, it was a full gospel businessman's yeah. convention. And then, Ka Catherine well, Coleman was there. that story for the... For the <laughs> yeah, we don't want to, we, the, we don't want to give away too much. We're going to just give you little bits of stories that are in the film, because we yeah. go into great depth about that. Yeah. So it's one of those things you got to... You got to buy the. You got to buy it so to get the full it's story. Out. So, hey man, it is um, funny. It's funny. <laughs> yeah. Well, you know, this might be a good time to go to a clip, and when we come back, we're going to talk a little bit. Just again, I don't want to scare anybody away. We're going to talk just a little bit about what we're trying to do in terms of raise some funds for this, but we want to get back to the meat of the stuff too. So, Tommy, uh, you want to set up the first clip? I think Chuck should do Chuck, it because it's, little it's a little church. country church. What do we? Is it, is it a uh, song? Or? It's, <laughs> it's, 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 let's it's, let Tommy say. It's, it. All right, I'll set it. So, <laughs> it's a song that you guys did. No, no, I didn't, I didn't no, know if I was to tell the yeah. story of it or no, what. No, I, I got it. All sure. right. So, uh, you know, we, it was clash of cultures. It was, you know, we were these hippies. You know, the church never really invited us to come in. Well, I guess we just invited ourselves, but. Um, 
We were in Northern California, and we had this tension with some very conservative Christians, and we just thought, man, these people are as cold as ice. What is this? And we were staying in somebody's house, and there was a picture of a wall, a little country church, and our original guitar player, Fred, started playing this little lick on guitar, and Chuck wrote this song called Little Country Church, and we thought it would be fun. But it, it really, to a lot of young people, they say this is the story of the Jesus movement. So when we decided to do this film, we took something that was done in, from a live concert in 1973, showed that film while we sang live to it. So what you're going to see is a little snippet of the old and new of Little Country Church. So we're, are we ready with that clip, Marisa? Okay, let's go to that clip. Okay, well, that's a little, there's a little uh, snippet of that, of Little Country Church that you're going to see on the, on the uh, rockumentary. It's in, and the title of this piece is uh, Love Song, the Rockumentary, the Story of the First Christian Rock Band. Let me tell you a little bit about what we're doing in terms of what we're looking for. Uh, we have, as Tommy mentioned, we're probably about 50% into this. This has been a whole backdoor learning experience for all of us because it started out as a live concert that we were just going to put out. And through a number of circumstances, this thing has evolved and transpired and, uh, uh, into a, a full documentary. So we are, we've, we've, we've got about $50,000 invested in this. We're looking to raise another $100,000 to finish this. And so uh, what, we're, what we're looking for is anybody out there that would like to contribute to this piece of history. I know I sound like the uh, public television guy, but so be it. Uh, if you want to contribute to, this, to this, this project, we would love to have you partner with us. And uh, we'd love to put your name on our website uh, for a contribution. You can make a contribution a number of ways here tonight. We're, we're in the process of setting up uh, our, our websites, but uh, and the, do the donations that you make are tax deductible because they're going to go through the upper room and uh, we've, we've got a separate account set up for the Love Song documentary. So this is not going into my pocket. It's not going into any of these guys' pockets. It's all going to finish the production of this. And we'll finish and, it one way or another. And it's but a 501c3. And, and I would just want to say this. I didn't think I was going to say this, but this started because Ron and his wife Kathy valued this music and value artists uh, that are maturing that have something to say. So all this money has come out of Ron and Kathy's personal finances. And so what we're trying to do now, we realize this is, to do it right is a lot more expensive than any of us thought. And I mean, we have some incredible things with over 30 guests. It's very inspirational stories that will just blow your mind. So we're just trying to finish well and build a community of people who see value in this and preserving this. I'm going to have to explain to my wife now how I spent $50,000. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you. Yo, but just, just on the side, <laughs> Kathy came up to me. We did some filming last week in Nashville. And after a couple of nights, we got together with the Kagis and a bunch of people, Michelle Pilar that was in the film. And she came up to me with a big smile on her face, but I knew exactly what she meant. She says, boy, this film just keeps on giving and giving, doesn't it? <laughs> I went, yeah, it's got to hurt. <laughs> so, so, folks, if, if the Lord should lay upon your heart to help us out with this, you know, we'll take, we'll take uh, donations from whatever you can give, $10, $25, $100. If you're a corporate, a corporate guy, if you're a business uh, and you give uh, uh, $2,000 or more, We'll get your logo and your website address on the credits of the film. So uh, right now our website is lovesong.band. Lovesong.band. There's no .com on that. It's lovesong, one word, .band. That's all you got to put in. And it'll take you to the Love Song site that we're building. There is a donation page, right, Marisa? There's a donation page on there. Click on that. If you want to give by check 
for those of you who aren't electronically uh, savvy like, like so many, uh, write the check to the upper room slash love song. And that's all you got to do. Mail it to, and I think we've got the address to put up, Marisa, but I'll, I'll say it. There it is. It's uh, checks made payable to the upper room slash love song doc. And uh, mail it to 15550 uh, 15550-C. Rockfield Boulevard, Irvine, California, 92618. It's, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll put this up a couple times tonight. And otherwise, you can go right to the uh, website and donate that way. Um, and, and there's, a, I think, a credit card uh, a donation page. Um, so that's what we're doing. Can I just add one thing? Yeah. Uh, like we said, we've been working on this for three years, and uh, we've had a lot of talented people work on this. But we've got a couple more days to film here. I think we'll be about 98% done with the filming of our guests and, our, and the stories we want to tell. But it's going to take months to edit this. I mean, our goal would be try and finish this in four months. Finish the shooting, preview it all. By the way, when you do a shoot, you spend literally days and days and days and sometimes thousands of hours, it seems, trying to figure out the 10 seconds and the 30 seconds of this. So there are months of work ahead of us, but we just need our community of faith to come together yeah. and help us finish this well. Absolutely. And, and let me say this about the, we labored very hard about um, uh, asking for funds. And particularly yeah. these three gentlemen here have been really very apprehensive about going out to, to try to raise funds because they still have the same spirit they did when they were doing Love Song. And they would take anything, you know, in terms of what uh, the church could pay or whatever, whoever was hosting them. And so they've got ministry hearts, and that's what this is about. And, you know, we're, it's... The other thing I would say is, as we've looked into the business of making films and distributing, going through a distributor and then going through to Netflix and, and all these people, you don't get nothing out of it. Yeah. I mean, the distributors keep all the money. Yeah. This is not a, a for-profit endeavor. This is it's pure correct. ministry. Like, nobody's getting going to make any That's pile right. of money off of this at all. It's just telling the story and documenting something like Greg Laurie said. He said in many ways, Love Song was the soundtrack of the last great American revival. That's right. And you know, there's something about music. It just touches you in feeling. It gets past a lot of stuff. Sometimes more effective than talking. Yeah. And it's, it's about getting the, the message out, getting yeah. this, this story out that needs to be told because it really was a God thing. It, Jay, did you have any idea when you guys were playing back in the day the, the impact that you had at the time? All I knew is um, <clears throat> you could tell that um, God was using us. And yeah. uh, it's like I, I had to come home from the road and explain to my wife why I didn't have any money. <laughs> but I said it was really, yeah. I'm telling you, God really moved, you know. And then, you know, I mean. <laughs> did he move any money? <laughs> I, you know, I'm one of the. Three of one of the out of the three that's not not married anymore. But um, anyway, um, it's not that that's the reason. But uh, we never asked for money, and that that was the deal. I mean, I remember going to Chuck for it to get a pair of socks. He kind of no Chuck, him. Okay, he ran kind of ran our deal because whatever yeah. offerings we got, you know, someone had to kind of keep yeah. it. So Chuck was kind of like love offerings. We had a, yeah. a lot of love and very little offerings. <laughs> did, you, yeah. did you give him the money for the socks? Yeah, I, 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 I literally kept the books and records for a long time. And I, when I was moving years ago, I found the book in my garage. I wish I had kept it. it. Was zero 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 thirty bucks? If we had a hundred bucks, we were doing backflips. No, no. I have a funny story. My friend, uh, uh, his, his name is also Jay. He was uh, he was. We went to had breakfast in, in Newport. Um, kind of down by Cappy's, but another place. And uh, he goes, I got to show you this place. And so we're gone by the, they call it the river jetties. And there's this old trailer park down there, right at the river jetties. So he takes me into the, we drive into this trailer park and he's driving around this trailer park. He goes, what do you, this place is like a trip, isn't it? And he goes, you know what? This is where I spent my honeymoon. <laughs> we had a, we had a trailer there for 75 bucks a month. Yeah, I mean, yeah. the bathtub was like that big and about that deep. And I, my dining room table was that big. And my friend Vance comes over from Hawaii and he stays with us for two weeks, right after I'm married in this little trailer. Oh, just, just think about that for a minute. But anyway, <laughs> another check the box anyway. Uh, but it, we didn't really have any money. We didn't, yeah. uh, we just, uh, we wanted to serve the Lord and God poured his spirit out through us. You could feel it. The, 
the worse the situation was, the more you could feel oh, God. I mean, it was almost so like true. a fog. Yeah. We, we we did that Oral Roberts thing when we were in yeah. T-shirts and Levi's, and it was a junior senior prom. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, tuxedos and yeah. formals, and we're hiding backstage. We're going, and we just we got shut out of the house we were Nobody staying at. Nobody told us. And we, we we had to all jump in the shower. We had 15 minutes to shower, and we all had long hair and beards. And anyway, we uh, we get there. We're starving because we haven't had anything to eat all day. We've been anyway. I'm crawling around a buffet counter on the floor trying to get food, and there's people on the outside in the with the sneeze guards, kind of you know they can kind of see me, and um, we the curtains opened that night. We were the featured band too. There, some girl that sang one of the songs in Jesus Christ Superstar was right before us. Anyway, the curtains close. We all go out there in our deal, and the curtain opens, and there's Oral Roberts in the front right, row, bro. and we just start playing our songs and it's like 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 I said it's just like this fog mm -hmm. Oral Roberts comes back he's he's tears in his eyes in the in the deal you know I mean it's just it was it was really a um, God was unbelievable mm. so yeah. in, in the middle of race riots and parks I mean yeah crazy stuff you know we, we talked about this recently we, we were church boys so we and we weren't far removed from the drug culture, which right. we were deep in. So we knew how to get in the middle of a race riot and, and sing rock and roll music or right? a rock concert or yeah. a rock concert. You know, we, and you had to be really flexible. But I want to go to the story. Uh, we were in the drug culture on Laguna Beach, right down the street from Timothy Leary, mm -hmm. and we were in. Everything was falling apart. So we come to Christ, and we, you know we start going to Calvary Chapel, which we'll tell a little more depth. And we wound up living, we, we said, we got to get out of this drug culture. So we, this guy gives us his place to live above a garage on the floor. That was where we... <laughs> we all had a corner. <laughs> yeah, we just, there was this carpet about an eighth of an inch thick and a wall No heater. furniture, nothing. Nothing. Yeah. We just had a corner. Yeah. No and, uh, insulation, just, the, you know, the bare uh, tar paper and wood. You know, yeah, studs. Oh, right. Yeah, you know. Yeah, yeah. But Chuck can sleep on anything, so he was happy. But... <laughs> it, this was a guy named Bing Turnham, and we yeah. lived at his house above the garage. And one day we're at church, and this lady comes up to me, and she said, I heard you guys don't have a place to live. And I said, no, we're just we're living above the garage. And we wrote Jesus puts a song in our hearts right up there and stuff like that. We, we were happy as can be. She says, I want you guys to move into my house. I mean, this is unbelievable. A bunch of scruffy, scary-looking hippies <clears throat> and this retired school teacher couple named Gene and Dean Gilbert moved us into their house. Yeah. And had they not done that, we wouldn't have been as free about the money situation. Yeah. If somebody called Chuck Gerard and said, can you come to Juvenile Hall? We just said yes. Mm -hmm. And I, I say to a lot of people, just say yes. If God asks you to do something, just say yes. Yeah, we played like sometimes two or three all times a day. Or all something. the time. Yes, we were like firemen. You know, the phone would ring and we'd just get in the van and jump. <laughs> Or we, or Chuck Smith would pick us up and we go with him and go play at some high school or anywhere. So uh, it was uncharted waters. Nobody had been down this sure. road yeah. before. Yeah. Chuck, um, t tell us. Uh, we're sitting here with three original members. There are some other members that have played in Love Song, uh, and they're not here tonight. Let's talk about the other guys that were that are in the band or were in the band or parts in the band. Yeah, so well, the two guys that uh, are not here tonight that are the, were the main, uh, t there were several peripheral guys that came in for a week or two at different times, but uh, of course we start with John Mailer. Uh, drummer. John drummer, Mailer. John, and um, I'm going to let Jay take that one in a minute because Jay was closer to John and he can tell the story a little better, but then Fred Field, he came out of the Army with Tommy and, um, and Chuck Butler, yeah. and um, we were all just kind of all gathered there at the same place, and Fred was our original guitar player. He played mandolin and violin. For a while, <clears throat> we didn't even have John in the early days. That's John right. was living in Salt Lake City. Jay can probably bring you up to speed on that. So we played without a drummer, and it was fine. You know, I mean, we'd prefer a drummer, but... Uh, so the original lineup really was um, Fred Field, Tommy, Jay, and myself. And then later on, John came and back. And we were all we played all acoustic in the old days. And, it, and the, it was, the vocal blend was so awesome. Yeah. Then we I went mean, electric. Yeah. Yeah. yeah we, we, we uh, gradually we kind of got our stuff. We had the stuff, but we just never brought it out. Vocal in fact, blend. tell yeah. tell them the story about the when Chuck Smith called up one day and asked John oh, to, yeah. John, oh. to, John to bring his drums to church. 
because we we played we had played at the this okay John stayed in Utah we all moved back uh, after Love Song kind of went up there for a while and we joined Love Song anyway John got married and um, to a girl from Salt Lake and so we all moved back John stayed there eventually John came back after we moved into the Gilberts and they <laughs> John and Linda and their son their little son uh, Christian lived in a camper uh, shell out in the in the yard huh. and um, so uh, we ended up uh, one day the the in, once again we weren't playing with drums John was playing like bongos, bongos. we played the troubadour with uh, for Ahmed Erdogan uh, we were gonna he wanted us to record us in Muscle Shoals and do some deal Atlantic, he loved he Atlantic loved our Atlantic local records. vocal blend and uh, I remember I didn't even play bass that night. I just slapped my leg, right. and it was oh. all acoustic. And John was on the sitting down playing bongos, and that was kind of how we were doing that. And yeah. those. And anyway, one day the phone rings, and it's Chuck Smith, and he goes, "Hey, let me talk to you know John." So so he got John to bring his whole drum set over to church that night. And what was the what was the psalm? Uh, the, the the psalm one fifty. Yeah, well, yeah. Let, let, but, and, and, and Chuck tells the story. He's like. John's on the phone talking to Chuck Smith. Oh, hey, what are we going to do now? He says, no, Chuck just wants me to come bring my drums. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> so, we I mean, went, what? Imagine this what? Lit, a little chapel with like yeah. 250, 300 people. This guy comes in who can play like Buddy Rich, who's unbelievable, or John Bach. A Bobby. phenomenal drummer. I'm unbelievable drummer, and he does a drum solo in church. Now, can and, imagine. And Chuck reads the scriptures, you know, praise the Lord on a, you know, the cymbal and, you know, the tim the cymbals and blah, blah, yeah. blah, with a loud, you know, anyway. And John does the drum solo. That's probably the first time that yeah. ever happened. And yeah. it was. Incredible. And it was always a highlight of our concerts. Go ahead. And, and John's not here because yeah. he lives in Sweden. Exactly. Uh, we talk about Bob Wall yet? Oh, well, Bob Wall, yeah. <laughs> There's big omission there, right? Yeah. Well, it is the late Bob Wall, we're sad. Yeah. That, yep. but the, uh, I remember one time we were touring in, with the Chuck uh, Smith tours of 2010. And Bob said, one of these days, we're going to get the call meaning one of us has gone to be with the Lord, and it turned out to be Bob. Yeah. But uh, what happened with Bob was mm -hmm. that um, uh, when Fred left, Fred mm -hmm. and John left to form another band, right about the time we were making our first album, and we were scrambling. We needed a guitar player. And enter Freddie Pirro, who is a, we haven't mentioned tonight, but Freddie Pirro was the guy that started the label that we were on called Good News Records. You were not on Maranatha. You were on no. we were never Mar on Maranatha. Maranatha didn't have any distribution and no money. We right. were on and this we, album only. Go yes. ahead. And we thought we can't reach the world yeah. right. at this point. Yeah. You know, it's out of a Sunday school room. So. Well, yeah. part of it too was we wanted to be on a label where we possibly could cross over. That's always been, you know, the, the, big goal of, at least sure. in the early days, oh well, man, we can maybe get a hit on the radio and be played with the Beach Boys. But like uh, somebody said, uh, if, you, if you cross over, you got to bring the crossover. And what sort of <laughs> the, the people who've had the opportunity to do that have not really done a good job of that necessarily, yeah. in my yeah. opinion. But anyhow, so we needed a guitar player fast and Freddie Pirro was involved in our life. It's too long, it'll all be in the documentary. But um, uh, there, Bob was homeless, kind of. I don't know, remember if he was, he was married sleeping, or not. He was, he was sleeping, sleeping under the piano yeah, yeah, but he, in the studio, remember, in the recording I, I know, studio. but I don't remember why he was homeless. I, I, I don't either. If he was divorced or hadn't been married yet. So, he, yeah, he, was, he had no place to sleep, so he'd sleep under the piano in the studio. And then Freddie was, he was getting a band together, and he was trying to get Freddie interested in his band. And Freddie said, I heard about this group in L.A. I've been talking to him, and their guitar player just left. Why don't you go down and, and you know see if you're interested or if they're interested in you? So Bob came down to Long Beach Municipal Auditorium. Municipal Auditorium and started to hear our band, and he really was moved by it. And eventually he felt like uh, the Lord was leading him to come into the band, and uh, he auditioned, and we loved him, and he learned all of Fred's guitar parts because Fred was already gone. Yeah. A part of the story. There'll also be on the DVD. Yeah. Uh, but and Bob was, was an awesome guitar player yeah, and awesome, yeah. awesome singer too. Yes, he was. Yeah. But he learned all of Fred's parts, uh, you know, verbatim yeah. for that first album. Then on the second album, Final Touch, of course, he had the ability to work out his own guitar parts, and that's where we really saw his skill. Because on the first album, he was just doing Fred's parts. Yeah. Yeah. But on the second album, he was. Amazing guitar player. Yeah. He was an absolutely amazing guitar player, and we have a wonderful uh, piece on on Bob Wall telling the story and how he came in. It's a very touching yeah. piece. But then there was also one member who was temporarily in the group for a while uh, that we're forgetting. 
Uh, Chuck Butler? <laughs> no. No. Phil Keggy. Oh, oh Phil, Phil Keggy. Keggy. Yeah. Yes. So Hello. Phil, Phil filled in for Phil filled in for uh, Bob Wall. After for, Bob left, yeah. Well, Bob, Bob, yeah, Bob had an emergency. He had a yeah. family emergency. He had to leave the band. Uh, he eventually came back for our reunion tour and all yeah. that. But yeah. Phil came in and uh, spent about three months with us. Yeah. You want me to tell the story about? Oh, I, I think it's well. Let's story. hold that. What story are you going to tell? About how we Finding how Phil. we how we how we. How we Heard about Phil Kagan? Well, let's save that for the video. Well, let's do. We're going to do some teasers tonight. Okay. But I, here's what I thought we'd do because we're we're getting some questions. I think we want to have time to go to some of those questions. Let's go to this clip, and I'll set this up, and then we'll come back and take some questions. But hold that thought, Jay, and we'll come back to that. But the next clip we're going to watch is these gentlemen were inducted into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. And what year was that? Twenty oh five. Really couldn't tell I think you. No. Some, okay. No. No. Well, it doesn't matter. We're 2012, maybe. Yeah, 2012. Yeah, it's after okay. Okay. Uh, Michael W. Smith does the introduction. How quickly did we forget? Yeah, and that's the piece we're going to see right now, yeah. right? Okay. So let's go ahead and watch that. We'll come back and go to some questions. So let's go ahead and run that one. My town is really small, where I'm from. And I remember walking up on Chestnut Street, and I walked into what I thought was just a sort of hands-down clothing store, and there was a record bin in there, and there was this album white album with a red Maranatha sign on the front and it said the everlasting living Jesus music concert and I and I looked at this cover and I turned the cover over and everybody had long hair and I'm going this is awesome <laughs> this is awesome and I took it home and I listened to it and I God's honest truth it wasn't but a month later that I walked down the aisle of my Baptist church and thought this is what God wants me to do for the rest of my life. How I was going to ever get there, I have no idea. I believe that was such a God thing. And I really believe, in large part, really in some ways, I'm not really sure that I would be doing what I'm doing today if it hadn't been for Love Song and that record. And that record changed my life. And it's from the heart. So on behalf of the Board of uh, Directors of the Gospel Music Association, it is my great honor to induct Love Song into the Gospel Music Hall of Fame. Love you guys. You can see what, what uh, impact that uh, Love Song had on Michael W. Smith. And so uh, that's one of the little clips that you're going to see in the documentary. Marisa, we've got some questions. Let's, can we bring a question up here tonight? Okay, this is from Ed Tomlinson. It's, how long did it take Main Street churches to accept Jesus movement music? <laughs> We touched on that a little bit. <laughs> oh, my gosh. Hey, we were at a Lutheran camp, uh, which a friend of mine was there, uh, a Russian mm. guy from Montebello, an old surf buddy of mine. And uh, he was up there as like a youth minister or something. And I, I don't know. We got, we got invited to a lot of churches from kids that came to Calvary. Right. Cause, and they were, you know, to their family churches. Uh, and the churches didn't really know what, what the kids were bringing. But... Uh, Anyway, one of them, we were at this camp, and we were just playing acoustic guitars, and they thought we were from the devil. I mean, we were doing a, we were, I mean, seriously, it was crazy. And then we, we go to a, a Lutheran church. Someone invite us to go to their, and we made a, I remember we had the first time this church ever clapped in church, ever, to a, to a song. And then we did the Seventh-day Adventist church, and we all used to be vegetarians. And we, when we moved in with the Gilberts, we, I remember eating our first Steak, steak dinner because we asked our pastor Chuck he goes you know because we're staying with families most of the time we're not staying in hotel rooms or even motels we're like with families and uh, you know they they fix you food and you're not well I can't eat that you know what I'm saying so I mean so we he said you got God is basically says all things are you know just bless your food and yeah. So anyway, we had our first steak, and so we're at the Seventh-day Adventist church. We have no idea what Seventh-day Adventists are. And, Ch and Fred goes, he starts sharing his testimony, and part of the testimony is how he got delivered from vegetarianism. <laughs> 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 and, the, of course, the whole place cracks up, you yeah, know, because yeah. they knew we, we had no idea what we were even, you know, yeah. what, what they were about. Yeah. We, we found ourselves in situations that were very awkward, like Jay was talking about, all the time. We'd be backstage going like, Lord, we have nothing in common with these right. people. 
wow, unless you build a bridge, we're dead in the waters. And sometimes with just one song, yeah. the aha moment would happen. And that was at the full gospel thing. Same well, thing. It, it, yeah, that there. But I mean, it just happened a yeah. lot of time in these conservative churches. And yeah. it, we, we realized we scared people. We had to prove ourselves. And I think I would say after Explo 72 happened, a lot of things changed because people came from all over the world. It was a campus crusade vision. And, you know, gosh, 80, 90,000 people, according to the people that were there, made the cover of Time Magazine and Look Magazine and all this kind of stuff. Then all of a sudden, even the Baptists, you know, who were, you know, all about evangelism, but they didn't understand the package <laughs> that yeah. came, it, yeah. they started going, well, hey, wait a minute now. Our kids are, they're wanting to know Jesus. We got to figure out how to bring these drug addict kids who are disenfranchised from their family and love on them. Yeah. And, but it, it definitely took a couple of years and the mainstream church, even with worship, it was 10, 15 years. Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah cause I it think, was all piano, organ, and choir. Yeah. I think that's, you know, just really kind of summarize the answer to that. I think Tommy hit the nail on the head there. That, that was a, a kind of a paradigm shift when people started to, well, they saw us play in the Cotton Bowl on Friday night and they're all looking with, you know, if God cleaned them up in the, Inside, outside, inside, why didn't clean them up on the outside? Yep. And uh, but the Holy Spirit fell, mm -hmm. and they felt that. And so yeah. I think, and many people told me this in years later, they started to reassess drums and guitars in church because they felt the anointing when we played. And then, then to me, it was a kind of slowly evolved into acceptance over a period of years. Yeah. I think his timeline is probably right. Yeah, 10, we. Uh, Billy Graham spoke that night too, which was another kind yeah. of like a uh, affirmation. Yeah, thing. and uh, but in the early days, we used to play with Andre and uh, his band all the time. All the time. And Andre Andrew was Schwartz. Andre Crouch. Crouch and, 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 and disciples. He, and he had a he was one of the top known black uh, gospel bands, and they were very contemporary. But he loved our band, and yeah. he really helped us. I mean, he yeah. he yeah. kind of just basically. Uh, was a brother to us that whole time. Okay. Really helped us try to, you know, and, and to give us some, uh, you know, some, like a, like Tommy says, a bridge to some of the mm -hmm. churches. We we ended up, we opened for the Edwin Hawkins singers one night up in uh, San Mateo. Yeah. And uh, when they were, had that Ooh. song, Oh Happy Day. Man, they were, they were Man, awesome. Man, they were unbelievable. And we, uh, we did, we played with uh, Billy Preston's mom's group, the Ladies of Song. Remember that? I remember the they album. Were, they yeah. were there, a uh, uh, black uh, yeah, yeah. gospel choir. Yeah. And uh, you know who else was at Expo '72 in that audience in the candle lighting ceremony? I just found out? Mike Huckabee. Really? It was a turning point in his life. Going like, what? What am I going to do? It's during the candle lighting ceremony. Hmm. Mike Huckabee saw where he should go. Oh, that's cool. If you're watching tonight and you tuned in a little bit late, we are we are trying to raise some funds to help finish this project. Our goal is to raise $100,000, and, and if you'd like to help, if the Lord should lay it on your help, to help put this historic piece out, uh, we'd, love, we'd love to have you partner with us in that. And you can make your donations by going to lovesong.band. That's all you have got to put in. You don't have to put in .com. It's lovesong.band. There's a donation button there, and Maurice is going to put up, if you do want to write a check, uh, you can do that. It's to the upper room uh, slash... Uh, the love song doc, and that's going to be mailed to uh, 15550 C Rockfield Boulevard, Irvine, California 92618. We'd love to have you partner with us. Again, uh, corporate guys, corporate uh, business owners, we'd love to have your, uh, your, uh, your help in this. $2,000 or more, we'll put your label, your uh, logo on the uh, credits and your website along with that and help you promote your business that way. We're hoping to get this, this project into tens of thousands of people's hands. So The other thing, if you're just tuning in, this is not a for-profit venture. It's not a for-profit This is venture. a ministry all the way. We've oh. spent forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000. We need to really finish this well. We're about halfway. There's a lot of editing and filming left to do, but we have 30 guests already. So nobody's making money on this. Yeah, yeah, it's been our life story. And also, it's all about you, ministry. That's right. And if and also, if you tuned in late and you're wondering why, well, how did you get far this far? And now you're raising money. It's because this this morphed into a documentary where right. it was just going to be a live concert right. we were going to publish. And uh, so this kind of came in uh, through the back door, if you will, and uh, and we're working through it that way. So. That's where we're at well, and we're also, trying to do. Also, you need to make sure they know it is a, a tax deductible. It is a tax deductible yeah. because it's going to the upper room 
uh, which is a 501c3, your donation is tax deductible. And so that's a great thing, but that money is not going to go to the upper room in terms of their, you know, uh, their, their production and their expenses. It's all going to go to this, this video. And so, and nobody's getting paid. We're, this is all doing... We're free, all labor. Doing this. free labor. <laughs> yeah, lots and of I, free and labor. I might say, uh, the four of us, uh, and particularly Tommy and Chuck and I, have spent uh, countless hours... In the thousands, in I'd thousands say. thousands of hours uh, going through meticulously clips and talking and, and then uh, editing here in, uh, in California and also back in Nashville with uh, Nathan DeGisari, uh who's doing our editing back there. And um, so many, many hours have been put into this thing. And uh, so let's, let's go to another question, Marisa, and uh, see what we've got there. Uh, this is from Ed Arthur. Ed Arthur is a friend of mine. Uh, do you think there could be another movement of God in today's unrest? Good question. Answer is yes, and I think a lot of people are really starting to pray for it and look for it. And there's also been a tremendous surge in interest in the Jesus movement and how that happened and how the Holy Spirit used it. Greg Laurie wrote a book called Jesus Revolution. Irwin Brothers are hoping to make a film on that. We know somebody else is making a documentary on the overall uh, uh, Jesus movement. Uh, Wheaton College and Biola are partnering on permanent exhibits on the Jesus movement. Biola has created a center for the study of the Holy Spirit. The first conference they intend to have is on the Jesus movement. So there's something stirring here, this unrest of in discontent, and, and I think a, a drive like we had during our early years of who is Jesus, how do I follow him, what does it mean, and how do I get used by the Holy Spirit, how do people really come to uh, a saving grace understanding and, and, and a realization that you need a savior, you cannot do these things on your own, you need a redeemer. Well, and it's just like you're saying, Tommy, the, the, the uh, atmosphere right now in, in the country, in the world, is similar, different, but similar. Yeah. People are searching. People are scared. People are uh, bewildered. They don't know what to do. We've got this virus, and on the heels of this virus, we've got this crazy um, uh, uh, protesting and demonstration as a result of a, uh, of a policeman uh, putting his knee on somebody's neck and this, this gentleman's neck and killing him. Just crazy stuff. And uh, <laughs> I saw a, uh, I posted it on my Facebook page. It's a, a little meme that uh, uh, the guys from um, Back, Back to, to the, the Future, future. Uh, the, the crazy hair guy, I can't remember his name, but he's saying, Marty, whatever you do, don't, don't uh, type in 2020. In the so, DeLorean, right? Yeah, in the DeLorean, <laughs> that's right. Uh, I, so, uh, it's a crazy time, folks. And so, the other to thing your I, question, Ed. The uh, other thing I would say is the younger generations, the millennials, stuff like that, they've been looking for authenticity at the top yeah. of the list. Yep. You know, I had a young kid say to me, you Christians like to talk a lot. What did you actually do? Yeah. And that's why I like what Franklin Graham is doing. It's like he puts the faith into actions, puts volunteers helping to help people. You know, they, people need to see faith in action. Yep. Enough yakety yak and enough cheating riches or sleeping with your neighbor's wife. That's not going to help people find Jesus. Right. right. It's Little added perspective it. on Ed's question, and I know where, I know Ed as well, and where he's coming from. Most people, when they ask about whether it be another revival, they're really thinking American. Mm, yeah. You know, because really the Jesus uh, revolution that we were part of really was more of a U.S. phenomenon. It did leak into Canada a little bit and some in Europe, but mostly it happened here. Yeah. Yeah. And in a more of a worldwide perspective, there is already kind of a Jesus movement going on in many countries. There's a lot of stuff happening with the Muslims. Yep. Unprecedented yeah. stories and numbers of Muslims coming to Christ yes. and all throughout the uh, other parts of the world. But we, we put our perspective on America because we yeah. live here and we do want that same thing to happen here in America. So who knows? Yeah. That's a good happen. point. People are dying for their faith in Asia mm -hmm. and in Africa. Right. They probably They're, laugh at us if they. Oh, you mean what do you want a revival? You want persecution? We got it already. You know. Yeah. 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 Well, one of the things that uh, we have really wanted to uh, try to reach with this project is uh, a younger generation. One of the things we found that uh, there's some young men that are that are out doing music now that were impacted by Love Song. We we had a chance meeting with a young fellow named Ben Calhoun from uh, a group called. Um, 
Citizen Way. Citizen Way, out in Nashville just last week. By happenstance, he came to a filming that we were doing, and we captured him. He talked about how important Love Song was in him, with him and his family. Uh, another one was Chad Butler from Switchfoot, who we have a clip on in the uh, in the in the documentary. That's a, great, and then, a great story that people are going to love. Well, and then of course we have uh, Jeremy Camp, which I think we, we have a clip of, and mm -hmm. let's go to Jeremy talking. Can I about, set it up? Yeah, go ahead. I was on the road with Franklin Graham, and uh, Jeremy is a phenomenal guy. Uh, you know, people don't even really know how successful the guy's been. It's just ridiculous. And he's been through a lot of heartache, lost a wife to cancer, wrote all these great songs out of brokenness. But the guy, boy, he loves Christ. He wants to see people come together. So we were out on tour, and I heard he had a, his his family was affected by uh, by the Jesus movement of love song and a mustard seed faith in some of these bands. So I got an interview with him right on the side of the bus out on the road. And you mentioned Mustard Seed Faith. One of the people I forgot who we're, we're going to get a clip from is uh, Odin Fong from Mustard Seed Faith, and he's going to contribute a clip to our, uh, to our, our documentary as well. Uh, so let's go ahead and go to the Chad, I'm sorry, uh, Jeremy the Jeremy Camp, Camp uh, clip, if we will. You know, the Jesus People movement and Love Song in particular, Mustard Seed Faith, you know, just that whole movement, God did an incredible thing in my family's life, uh, which has impacted me. And I remember my, my father, uh, he plays music as well. And I remember his seeing these bands proclaim the gospel of Jesus Christ and going, that's what I want to do. And I remember him going out and locally to these different towns and preaching the gospel. And I know it was inspired by the Jesus People Movement, Love Song, all the songs that came out of that. Really the desire to be led by the Spirit and to see lives change for Christ. So, so thankful for what God's done through Love Song. Um, I'm excited to, to hopefully in some way be a part of what that did and continue that passing that torch along to somebody else. So you can see how uh, Love Song impacted uh, even this next generation. We talked about Michael W. Smith and what, what how that happened. And we we also have... Uh, we don't have it yet, but Stephen Curtis yet. Chapman Stephen has Curtis told Chapman. me, to, yeah, so we're hoping to get Stephen, he's got some great stories about he and his brother learning to play and early stuff learned all of our songs the first half the first album yeah so there, it's a it's a uh, very impactful uh, thing to see the fingers that uh, love song uh, that, where it's gone over the years and, and how it's impacted and quite frankly what it's done to contemporary music today we call it ccm uh, and uh, these guys invented it quite frankly so, so I Chuck and I, in particular, have been involved in evangelism and worship. Yes. Both of us have spent years writing, producing, singing worship songs and leading worship. One of the things I don't think we've told yet, and maybe we want to capture this week when we do our new videos, is that all this music was about evangelism. All these bands, like The Way and Mustard Seed, it was all about telling our generation. But at the same time, like two rivers running parallel were all these brand new worship songs like I Love You, Lord, and Lord, I Lift Him in High, and Seek Ye First, and Father, I Adore You in these things. And, you know, uh, this this album right here, the very first thing Maranatha did, I wrote the very first worship song that Maranatha ever recorded. And Love Song had recorded two songs on praise albums that, uh, you know, praise the Lord and bring my body closer. So we were, all of our concerts involved worship. Mm -hmm. and, and keep in mind, this was hymn book, choir, organ, piano. It was this stuff, right? And, and we come along, and not just us, but our whole community of young people, Paul Clark and Phil Keegan, everybody, with acoustic guitars and a whole new song of love to the Lord. And the church really criticized that a lot. Yeah. You know, where's the depth of the theology and stuff? But the young people completely got it. Yeah. And then pretty soon, there was a breakaway from the hymnal, which is in some ways not good, but you know, to, to abandon that. But people were singing from the heart. Cliff Barrows used to call it community singing. But we've both, all of our lives since then, we've been involved in worship too. And it, what happened with these young musicians, it changed the music of the church forever, yep. ever. It's like, you know, you've got all these great young writers now, you know, Phil Wickham and, you know, all these guys are writing these phenomenal worship songs. In fact, Phil Wickham's dad was in the way. And Phil's one of the top worship writers right now. Chris Tomlin and all these guys. 
uh, if you saw the clip by uh, Michael W. Smith a little bit earlier, this, again, as Tommy mentioned earlier, this is the album he saw in a little used uh, clothing, clothing store, store. <laughs> in somewhere in West Virginia where he grew up. And he said, I turn this thing over, and he sees a bunch of guys with long hair, and he says, I got to be there where that's going on. And, um, and this, is the, this is the album that he saw, and you can see right here, Love Song uh, contributed to that. It was their only uh, release on Maranatha. They were on uh, Good News Records, other than that. Yeah, um, we had a, it was distributed by um, United Artists, which goes back to what Chuck was. We wanted it to, to go out yeah. in a kind of a secular, even though we were singing Christian. In fact, a lot of people at United Artists had no idea that we were a Christian band for quite a while. Yeah. They would listen to the music, and they just, even though you know, because it was, it was, they just didn't really, because it, it was so different than normal gospel right. music yeah. that they didn't. Yeah. It, it sounded it, like pop music, yeah. Yeah, it didn't yeah. It, they just anyway? It wasn't Cortez, and yeah. it wasn't black yeah. gospel from Detroit. Yeah, and and that's how we got the number one record in the Philippines too. Yeah, which is another which is story a whole other story. Talk about yeah. it in the, in the in the documentary. I should say the Rockumentary. They're calling it the Rockumentary. Hey, again, folks, uh, we're trying to raise some funds here. Uh, let me give the address again. Uh, it's, uh, the, it's lovesong.band. That's all you type in. You don't have to type in .com. It's lovesong.band. There's a donation button there. Uh, you can give a credit card there uh, if you would like to donate. And uh, if you want to write a check, we've got it up on the screen there. Uh, you're going to write the check payable to the upper room slash love song doc. And that's going to be mailed to the upper room at 15550-C, Rockfield Boulevard, Irvine, California, 92618. And again, folks, if you're a, a ladies and gentlemen, if you're a corporate person, if you're a business owner, uh, we'd love to have your partnership for a donation of 2000 or more. Uh, and more is always great. <laughs> uh, we'll get you our logo on the uh, on the credits of this film, along with your uh, website address, and uh, you know, a lot of a lot of eyes will get on that. So uh, that's what we're trying to do. Okay, I'm looking over in this camera. Okay, so um, let's do this. Let's go to another question, Marisa. Uh, okay, this is from Jason and Jenny Snowbeck. If you were to produce a younger Christian artist besides producing their music, how would you father and or pastor them, and what would that look like? That's a really important question. Something that's been on my heart for years. It's like, you know, the Christian music industry has elevated a lot of people who are 15 to 18, and for the most part been disastrous other than Amy Grant. You know, she started really young. Uh, and so you make a rock star out of some person, whether it's secular or Christian, you know, all of a sudden they have a lot of money and they don't know how to handle anything. You know, there's, you have to learn how to be a real Christian, how to follow Christ. But there's a lot of disciplines that go with it. I mean, you know, who, who are your wise counselors? You really need that. And yeah. when you're young, you, you, there's a lot of stuff you don't know. Right. And, and if you're very successful, you get a lot of people around you who want a piece of the money pie. Yeah. And so their interests are not necessarily your best interests. A great uh, example to me has been Carrie Job. Carrie Job, I got to interview her backstage. I mean, she has always been surrounded by these solid people. She doesn't go off on her own, zooming around, you know. And she's very effective. Uh, I've seen a, a lot of people that didn't get mentored. Michael W. Smith had some people around him. Amy did too. But a lot of us did not. And a lot of us that have, have personal problems, uh, and a lot of people have been taken out of the game because of that. Well, I think you another know? important thing, which is maybe just kind of tagging on to what you're saying there, and not necessarily along the line there, but I think there's a conception out there, and there maybe there's a handful of Christian artists, particularly from your generation, your, your time. People have an, a, an idea that you guys just were rolling in the dough. You know, that you made a lot of money <laughs> yeah. doing that. Making pizza. Yeah, I mean, if you were in the secular world, no. uh, you would have, but uh, it, it, wasn't, uh, it wasn't that no. way. No. No, not, no, not at all. We, but we, we went to the Philippines. We, we, oh. we came back with nothing. We the didn't guy. Make, we, and they, there was no uh, 
it was back in the days of martial law. Plus, they didn't have any copyright uh, uh, stuff, you know. I mean, our, with United Artists, our stuff went out all over the world, but they didn't have to pay any royalties. So we, we might have, I don't even know how many records we sold when we were there. Oh but we, They were we, selling bootleg copies of our album right next to the ones we brought. Oh, man. And the guy who owned, he was James D, D.Y. was his name, from the Philippines. He took us to a very expensive restaurant the last day we were there after all the concerts, and he thanked us so much. And then he says, but I'm sorry, guys, you can't take any of the money home. It's against the law. Oh, man. I mean, yeah. you know, and, and not that we even saw any money. No, yeah, but right. we did get, you know, you get did get room service at the hotel. But you played in front of tens of thousands of. of That's yeah. twenty some fans. thousand. Uh, uh, nice. You guys were treated like yeah. rock stars. Hey, there. back on this question. We were the Beatles for a week. Yeah. yeah. Oh, it was, it was crazy. <laughs> National Guard around us. But yeah. back on this question, another great example has been what Louis and Shelley Giggle have done with Passion. You think of David Crowder, Chris Tomlin, I think Watermark, and a lot of other really significant artists. They started as a youth movement in Waco, Texas, in the Baptist Church. And they had a heart to reach kids coming out of high school and into college so they didn't lose their faith. Yeah. Now, they have pastored and given a focus to all these artists, and they've stayed extremely productive. Yeah. Because they, they're writing, they have purpose and focus. And I think that's been largely missing. So it, to answer the question, if somebody said, here's this young artist I want to do, like, I wouldn't do it. In, unless we ha they had a team of people around them, you have finances, you have accountability, you have a person, that young person has to be willing to learn and wanting to have a heart that follows God. Yeah. If that's not there, I'm not doing it. Yeah. You know, so everybody wants to make music and have a hit record. Right. But if those other things are not there, long-term success is not likely. That's true. Yeah, and, and that heart, you know, the heart of, of, of ministry. Is, but you've got to have people around you who really care and yes. who have some business sense and who know how the industry works and can put up a little barbed wire. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> barbed wire. <laughs> exactly. Well, we've got about, uh, I think we've got about uh, maybe a little less than 25 minutes left. We've got a couple more clips that we do want to show, and we want to uh, bring in some more questions. Uh, so, Marisa, do we have another question we could bring up? Okay, this is from Don Wheeler. Uh, if you could go back and live it all over again, is there anything you would do differently? Don's another friend of mine. So who wants to take that one? Chuck, you want to take that one? There isn't anything I'd do differently as far as the, um, the way my life unfolded. I feel very blessed that I, I was one of the older guys here that got saved in 1970. Uh, and I, but I'm so glad that I met Jesus early and oh. don't have now I'm 76 years old. I don't have to look back and say, look at all those wasted years. So for that thing, I, I wouldn't change any part of that. I might change some of the th things that happened to me. I went through alcohol addiction as a Christian. I had other problems in my life. Uh, with God's blessing, I'm moving into my 50th year of marriage with the same woman. So that's been okay. I mean, yes. from yeah. that standpoint, I mean, not without the, you know, the. Sure the barbs and all the yeah. problems you go through, but we're still together. So, you know, by and large, I, if I had to look back and think of anything I'd change, I wouldn't change any of the circumstances. I'd just maybe change some of my choices, if I could uh -huh. make them better choices earlier, and that'd uh -huh. be about it. But yeah, yeah I, I'm so grateful, actually, that I've been given the life I've been given by the Lord, serving Him for all these years now, nearly. Well, I, I, my ministry is now 50 years old, so, wow. yeah. I, I, I have one that's semi-humorous. I would have hired a really good Jewish attorney. <laughs> I'm not joking because we went into negotiations with the other side's attorney. Nobody was really watching off for our and interest. And he was a really good Jewish attorney. Yeah, he was. <laughs> for, for the other guy. And it turns out he was getting 10% of the label's proceeds for representing him. We wow. were so naive. We could have gotten... We could have owned houses and condo complexes with the money we should have gotten off these albums. Yeah. We never got a dime off those albums. We yeah. got writer's royalties, but never a dime. And, and no offense to, to, to Jewish No, I, I right? love Jewish in attorneys. Fact, Al is, anyway. He, he's a great attorney. He's a, he was one of the best music attorneys on the planet. Yeah, but we should have, we should have borrowed some money yeah. to have our own representation. Yeah. yeah. I mean, here's what you, what you learn eventually. People are going to watch out for their interests. It's your business to watch out for yeah, your interests. Yeah. It's not theirs. Yeah, but we had no business sense. We'd, all well, we well, wanted we to do was serve God. It wasn't even on your radar. No, I mean, not at all. You, you, not you at just all. didn't even see it. We at, wanted to make a great album. Like Chuck said, you know, hey, the guy let us make the album we wanted to make. Well, here's mm -hmm. the truth of, about 
about your music and, and so many others that came out during that time is that it's, it was all as good, if not better, quality-wise, as what was coming out in the secular market. It's just that you guys were doing it for ministry. Mm -hmm. They were doing it for dollars. And, you know, and of course, these guys in, in the secular market made big dough, you know. Uh, they lost but, a lot of money on most of it. Well, they lost a lot of it, too. And folks, I'll tell you what, one of the things on the quality of the music on this live concert that you're going to see in the, in the uh, rockumentary, because we do cut away to some songs, the music quality is impeccable. It's really, really good. And, you know, after 50 years, I went and saw Crosby, Stills, and Nash about 10 years ago, and the guys could hardly sing. Uh, when these three guys got together and played, uh, their harmonies were there, their voices were there. Of course, you know, maybe they're not quite as strong as they were 50 years ago, but it was incredible. Chuck's better. Chuck's better. No. <laughs> He's still you. hitting those high registers. Yeah, there's only one song yeah. we had to move down a little bit. You know? <laughs> yeah. it was, but the, I but can the think of one more we ought to move down. Yeah, the cool. music is absolutely impeccable, and the songs are just wonderful. And I think what we're going to be doing, too, is we're going to be releasing the live concert separately. So if you want to watch the whole concert, you're going to be able to do that as well. So again, if, if, you're, if you're out there and, uh, and you would like to help us finish this project well, uh, go to lovesong.band. Uh, lovesong.band. No, no dot com, just lovesong.band and click on the uh, donation button. And also Maurice is holding up or putting up the uh, graphic again if you want to write a check made payable to the upper room slash Love Song Doc, and you can mail it to that address there at 15550-C, Rockfield Boulevard, Irvine, California, 92618. And we would love to have your partnership. Uh, and spread the word, would you, uh, to folks that, uh, that may want to help contribute to this historical piece, because it's going to be a great, great piece. We are really, really proud of what we've put together. Yeah, we, we want to finish well. I mean, we do. we've got a lot of great content, and we're going to shoot some more, but... Got a lot of time and money and hours going to be editing. Do you want to play any of those other clips? Yeah, let's go to a clip. We're going to go to, who wants to set up two hands? It's Tommy. Well, uh, yeah, the, the full story is in uh, the actual movie. But the, I, what I would say about two hands, like several other love song songs, this is one that says what the body of Christ ought to be, what I ought to be about. I would be using my hands to serve Christ and bring in somebody else with me. And, you know, some of these songs have just stood the test of time. They're just right down the, the center lane of what your Christian faith is. But a lot, one person has said, you know, when you write a really great song, you're kind of singing your prayers to God. Yeah. But it was also just an encouragement to the body of Christ to be about the work of evangelism. Love Jesus and bring a friend. Yeah. And so, it, it, yeah, Chuck Butler co-wrote it with me. He brought the lyrics to my mom's house. I sat it on my $75 piano and looked at it for three days and wrote the music. Excellent. All right, so we're going to watch a little clip on Two Hands. Give a listen to his story. Hear the message that we bring. Leave the faith swell up inside you. Lift your voice with us and sing. This is your part now. Accept him with your whole heart. And use your own two hands. With one reach out to Jesus. And with the other. That was a clip from uh, a, a, a song, Two Hands, and that was filmed at the live concert in 2017 at the Upper Room, and you can see the quality of that music there. Uh, you might saw, you saw a couple of other players in there with a different drummer and a different guitarist. Jay, talk, talk about uh, who was playing guitar there. Well, um, <clears throat> in, uh, I kind of like quit, I, I, the last, I was with uh, Richie Fure after his band, after uh, the Love Song reunion tour. And then after that, I 
was in the Chuck Girard band. We went to Australia, New Zealand, and Europe and stuff. Anyway, in the late 80s, I basically kind of retired from music, or actually late 70s, sorry. And then uh, I was, I've always been kind of into architecture. So I started working, I was been working for a Christian architect that actually designed the Calvary. And uh, so I had two parallel things. So I just, I had three kids. <laughs> I'm going, I need to, kind of, I just turned 30 and I just said, I gotta, I gotta get a grip here and make some, do something. So uh, I kind of got into full-time architecture. Anyway, I get a call um, in 1982 from a couple, from a Christian guy that we had met in Love Song during the way from the, a band called the Safaris, Jim Pash. Sure. And uh, he goes, you know, we just uh, lost our, get one of our guitar players. Uh, and would you want to play guitar in the Safaris? And I just went, I'm not really a guitar player. I'm a bass player, but um, I could probably, I started out playing guitar in a surf band. So yeah, I could, he said, I'll teach you every, all the stuff. So anyway, I got a Stratocaster and, and, and uh, you know, amps and reverb and I'm playing. So uh, anyway, uh, through that whole concert thing, we toured with the Beach Boys and, and Jan and Dean, and that was Phil. Phil Bartowell was the guitar player. Yeah. And so uh, that's how I met him. I met him, I've known him for years and years, 20 years. So we brought in Phil Bartowell yeah. for that concert, who played yeah, awesome. with the Beach Boys, and he's played with, uh, well, well, he's played with Jan and Dean. Jan and Dean, yeah. yeah. And, he, and he's a worship leader, but man, the guy is a phenomenal he's, he is singer. He's awesome. He's awesome. Wait, yeah. on, on this concert, that was the first time and only time we've played with him in Love Song. Yeah, he he cool. learned those 17 two yeah. songs. Oh, and he nailed them. Yeah. 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 And played crazy good on guitar. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Tommy, talk about Dave Owens, uh, who was on drums that night. Uh, Dave is the drummer in my band, the Tommy Coombs band. I mean, he's he's one of LA's best drummers. He's played with Thomas Dolby. He's a adjunct professor at Biola. He reads like a hawk. You can put seven pages of music and he'll read it perfect the first time. But he's been in my band for at least 10 years. And so when John Mailer moved to Sweden and we were going to do live events, Dave has been our drummer mm -hmm. ever since, you know, 2010 when we toured with Chuck yeah, Smith. You know. and Dave's and man, on, he's just on time and he's... We didn't oh, fix just, one thing oh, in, yeah. in the whole no, 17 he's got the, songs. He's got he's, the feel for our songs. Yeah, yeah that, he uh, does. We fixed us, but not him. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah he, was, he didn't need That's no right. fixing. That's right. We're going to talk a little bit about what you guys are doing before we end, but let's let's try to get a couple more questions because one of the things that's so hard is to uh, get to all the questions in, in a uh, well. Tonight we went 90 minutes and we're still having a hard time. But so, Marisa, can you bring up another question, if you would? Okay, this is from Cheryl Sim Simrau. Uh, will the film come to Canada? Uh, yes. Uh, we're not quite sure how yet, probably Pony Express, but <laughs> but no, we uh, it will be released worldwide uh, because it will be digital. It'll be uh, uh, and uh, and we're probably going to do some DVDs as well. Yeah. So, uh, but Cheryl, if you would just uh, keep your eyes on uh, lovesong dot band, lovesong dot band, and we're going to be putting uh, content on that page and talking about when it's coming out, but yes, it will be indeed and available. And we'll give you progress reports of yeah. how we're doing both financially and with the finishing of the project, too. Yes, indeed. But, yeah, unless you're in the remote wilderness in those most beautiful parts of Canada, you, you'll have access there. <laughs> because we've called it a movie, she may be thinking of theatrical release, oh, which okay. will not oh. be involved. Okay, so yes, uh, let's, good clarification, uh, Chuck. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's going to be a rockumentary. It's not going to be released in theaters. It's going to be uh, available electronically, uh, digitally, if you will. We're still working on distribution. We haven't decided how that's going to happen. Great for us on that one. Yeah, we need some wisdom there. Uh, but it will be available uh, digitally, and it will be available uh, by DVD. And so uh, that's how it's going to. So you will have it in Canada for sure. Uh, Marisa, let's bring up another question. Okay, this is from Jeff uh, Biger. What was your most fun song you played and loved? Most fun song you played oh, and loved? Wow. Well, Several. I I know um, for me, just a fun song was was uh, "Thumb Between the Pages." Thumb Between the Pages. Yeah, oh yeah. It. Book of Life. Book of Life. Book of Life. Really? Yeah, it's just so fun. It's just you know. It's the tongue. It's a tongue and cheek yeah, story. Yeah, it's a little comedy song. Written yeah. about a, a friend of ours who was a drummer who was a little slow coming to Christ, and he came crashing through the side gate one day, all excited about a scripture, and he had a thumb between the Bible. One of the ones that Chuck wrote that I loved, 
in the film is uh, full immersion ocean water baptism <laughs> by the sea. A real mouthful. We just call it ocean water baptism. It's really fun to play. It's yeah, like it's early fun. California surf music, yeah. but it, the words tell the story of what God did at those huge baptisms. That's but truth of, be told, it's all fun. You know, some yeah. of the yeah. songs are more serious, but I'm taking from the tone of his question, like just enjoyable to play. Yeah. Those are some of my favorites. When little, they country up, you know. little Country yeah, Church. Absolutely, yeah, absolutely. Little Country Church. Yeah. I love doing Front Freedom. Front Seat Backsight. Front Seat Backsight is a lot of fun, yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I had a lot of fun singing it with you guys yeah, on stage. Yeah, you're in the movie. <laughs> yeah. uh, but it was let's always, you behave. You won't yeah. get cut. You won't hit the floor. <laughs> I'll never work in this town you're again, right? right? Let's, do, uh, let's, do, let's go to a clip of Kathy Laurie, who is Greg Laurie's wife, uh, and how she was impacted by the group Love Song. Let's go to that clip. The one song that I so identified with was the song Little Pilgrim. And it's, it talks about uh, that we are all like pilgrims, but we're looking down the wrong roads in life and we're meeting up with dead end after dead end after dead end. And although I was just 14 at the time, I had been searching down some of those roads. I was raised as a Roman Catholic, but I wanted to go beyond what, um, what I had seen in the Catholic Church, which had very little impact on my life as a young person. I was um, taking drugs at the time. I w had been living in Southeast Asia, so I was looking down the roads of Hinduism, Buddhism, um, transcendental meditation, following the Beatles and so many of the cultural icons of the day, and coming up completely empty and when I heard that song I felt like they were singing about me and uh, happy to say this little pilgrim did find her way home okay we're back so that was Kathy Laurie and talking about little pilgrim and the impact that that had on uh, on her early Christian experience uh, we've got just a few waning moments left here um, one of the things that uh, I would want to, I wanted to bring up is the music back in the Jesus movement. You know, we, we talk a lot about the pastors, and this is no disrespect to any of the pastors, but music played an absolutely amazing part in drawing young people. Mm -hmm. It did for me. One of the things, and I'll just kind of share a little personal testimony, but, uh, you know, one of the things that always turned me off about Christians at that time is it was music. I thought it was music was stuffy. I couldn't relate. Oh, I heard that a lot. But when I started hearing, and particularly when I heard you guys, uh, I thought, wow, there's some music I could relate to. So it played an important, important part in the, in the development of the church. Mm -hmm. Every generation has to have their own voice. I, I, we've heard this kind of story a lot. In fact, in our film was a pastor named Tom Allen, who was in Houston, a friend of his drug him to hear this band he never heard of in Houston, and he was very disenfranchised with the church, although he knew he was going to be called to ministry. And he said the problem was the music, just wasn't speaking the language of me and my friends. So it gave, a lot of people have said this was the soundtrack of their early Christian faith, us and Andre and Larry Norman, mm -hmm. you know. Yeah. And I, I think that's important. Every generation kind of needs their own song to sing. Yeah. It's an expression of their own heart. Well, we've got about six minutes left. Chuck and all of you guys, let's, let's tell the folks what you're doing today and what you've maybe been doing over the last few years. And, uh, and then we'll, uh, we'll kind of go toward the end here. And sure. Well, I went solo in 1975 when the group disbanded in 73, I think. And then yep. we did our reunion tour. And uh, I already was preparing my first solo album. I had the blessing of having a song on that album called Sometimes Alleluia which accomplished a very difficult task of pulling you out of a group identity into your own identity as a solo yeah. artist. Yeah. So that was really helpful in that regard. And over the years, I've just been doing the same thing. I do street ministry. I go out on the streets, San Francisco and other places with some friends of mine, and we do old-fashioned street ministry. I play my piano on the corner of Telegraph and Haste in Ber Berkeley, and they throw bottles at us and stuff. Not, not really, but... Yeah, sure. Mental bottles, you know, yeah. and uh, so it's that's been fun. And uh, of course, as Tommy said, I've been uh, connected with uh, worship for a number of years. For all those years, I had a revelation of worship in 1980 in my own life that produced some worship songs, and uh, just still doing the same thing now. This whole situation with COVID is going to change the face of what the future may be. But that's what I've been doing up to this point, and uh, never looked back. Not a lot of great solo albums. A lot of them. Well, 
Jay, Jay, what tell the folks what you're doing these days? I'm just I'm kind of the black sheep of this whole bunch. Um, oh no, you're not. Yeah, I am. He's I, a super I, talented I was I was never. Uh, I was never really that guy that was out there by himself. I got asked to play at a, 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 a funeral one time for a, um, a Lodadio. Remember that? Oh, Tony. Tony, yeah. Tony Lodadio. And I, I was trying to play the song, and I remember I had to start the thing twice because mm -hmm. I was so nervous. Anyway, I've never been that solo guy. I was always a band, no problem. I could play with in any, any band in front of thousands, you know. Yeah. And uh, but I I've been doing architecture and I like I said I was with a Christian architect, and I've done a lot of churches, um, recording studios. I, well, I did a lot of recording studios too back in the day. Uh, but uh, I live on uh, you know I just work out of my house. Uh, I'm still doing architecture. Yeah. And a uh, little music every once in a while. Still yeah. kind of play my old surf stuff. Yeah. And uh, Chuck kind of comes and in. And he's designed all of our albums. I mean, he was yeah. this whole box set was Jay. I'm yeah. an artist, so I. He's an artist. And, he's uh, an artist. And, and I don't look back. And he no. underestimates his talent. And, yeah. Uh, but uh, he's but an incredible. Not everybody uh, is comfortable doing the solo thing, and I'm, I'm kind of one of them. <laughs> Tommy, tell us what you're doing. I did well uh, when Love Song broke up. Jay and I and John made a run another band called Wing of Prayer, and the Jesus was winding down. I didn't know what was happening, and then I I went to. Yeah, Mike McIntosh in 1971 or, or so asked me to produce a praise album, which was just all, all the early worship songs, and I did that, and that worked, and I started producing when I was home from on the road, and then I stayed home, and raised my kids and ran Maranatha Music, you know, for almost 30 years. And so you're doing right now? You're traveling with uh, Franklin Graham for 30 years all around yeah. the world with Tommy Coombs Band, yeah. and man, that's just awesome, going all over the world. Yep. Yeah. Folks, you uh, you see before you uh, pioneers of Christian uh, contemporary Christian music. These guys were were there when it all started, uh, and we are so so pleased to, to have them here tonight. And we're pleased that you joined us tonight. Uh, and one final uh, thought as we uh, as we close out, uh, if you would, please consider donating to this uh, project for us to finish it. And again, I'll give the website address. It's uh, Love Song. The band dot the, no, nope, love, song, love song the band no dot com no, love, love song dot band Lo no. it's going to maybe more okay uh, if we could it was love song dot dot band, band. it's there okay no dot com no dot just com it's just dot love song band. dot band that's hard to get used to it is. and there on the screen uh, is uh, is is the uh, if you want to write a check to us that's how you could do it folks like us on Facebook at the upper room presents tomorrow this uh, will be available for your friends that may not be on Facebook they'll be able to see this broadcast on YouTube at the upper room presents uh, subscribe to our page there and uh, you can go to these these guys pages as well and I think it'll be on there because we're, we're uh, cross uh, posting on their on their pages tonight so thanks for being with us and uh, we'll, we'll be with you next week, and we're going to announce who we're going to be with next week. So, uh, guys, thanks for being with us tonight. Thanks for having and us. And we're looking forward for this, this project to come out. Thanks for watching.